wow, what an exciting few last weeks in terms of space exploration news. For the second time, we've seen scientists finding something they think might be water plumes rising from the surface of Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, which might lead us to the conclusion that there is liquid water under the surface or we might find bricks of uh, future life. We've seen uh, Rosetta, the Rosetta mission, ending after 12 years out there in space, successfully serving the comet uh, 67 Jurimov, Jurisimenko, sending back these awesome pictures we really saw from this mission. And not at last, we saw Elon Musk talking about how to make humans an interplanetary species. My name is Jürgen Schleppi and I'm a space science engineer working in the field of space exploration and I'm looking at how we can augment these future missions with something we call in situ resource utilization. First of all, I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered how much material it is that we can actually take with you from Earth to the lunar surface? Hold that thought there. We will come back and answer that in a second. Now, before we talk about how much we can take, I'd like to explain why we would be interested in knowing that. As outlined here, NASA is thinking about bringing humans to the Martian surface. And on that way, there's a lot of technologies required for us to make this a possible journey. So in my opinion, it's essential that we start trying technologies on, on the moon first before we can go to Mars. Why do I think so? I think, having a look at this chart, the moon is much closer than um, Mars in terms, in terms of communication and sending a signal. It takes us a bit more than a second to send a signal to the moon. Whereas at best, it, if Mars is closest to us, it takes us three minutes to send a signal. In worst case, this goes up to 22 minutes. This is posing quite a challenge in terms of operations and uh, trying technology. So the idea is that we first start building a lunar base. And this is the vision of the European Space Agency, how they think it's going to happen. It is, they call it an international uh, space village, where all the international partners, all space-flying nations will be invited to contribute to. So basics like power and habitation will be provided, and basically giving everyone a platform to try the technology on the moon. But let's get back to my initial question there. How much do you think you can bring to the moon? Let's have a look at what we did in the past. Most of you might notice this is the Saturn V rocket that we used during the Apollo area to fly to the moon six times and land. And the Apollo uh, rocket, the Saturn V, is about 110 meters in height and has a total weight of 3,000 tons. This is an equivalent of about five fully loaded Airbus A380 jumbo jets. So that seems quite a lot. But let's get to it and dig into the details. This rocket is basically made up, 92% of it is made up of propellant. So this is not something we bring to the lunar surface. This is something we need to actually get there in first place, leaving us with the remaining 8% that are made of 6.5% structure just to hold everything together and make this thing work. And only 1.5% of these 3,000 tons, about 45 uh, tons, is the actual weight of the payload, which is the command and service module and the lunar module hidden on top of the uh, rocket. The command and service module being the, the top one and the lunar module being the bottom one. So is this 45 tons what we bring to the moon? Not quite yet. Looking even closer, we find out that the command and service module was just orbiting the moon and never landing. And the lunar lander itself is then only about 35% of the weight, an equivalent of 15 tons, or about seven cars. Is this now the answer? Almost. On the way down to the lunar surface, um, the lunar module needed to burn fuel to break uh, down and guarantee a soft landing. And the fuel that was burned during that landing was about eight tons, leaving us with only six tons of material that arrive on the lunar surface. This includes structure, this includes the astronauts, this includes um, even the food. Yeah, so it's not much you have to go on. So six tons of weight, we were thinking, is not really a lot to perform proper science or establish a lunar outpost. 
So what have we been looking at? We have been wondering at, okay, what do we know about the moon? And what is depicted here is the missions, manned and unmanned missions that went to the moon and gave us some, some data and some of the knowledge that we have about the moon today. Apollo 17 sent back this uh, great picture of the lunar surface. What you see here is mainly gray, and in the front area where the astronauts dug a trench, you see some reddish brown soil. So what is this material that we find in the moon? We scientists call it lunar regolith, and it's basically dust intermixed with um, boulders and bricks. And it has basically the same chemical composition as basaltic sand as we find it on Earth. So the bulk part of it, almost 50%, is silicon dioxide, common sand that we find on Earth, uh, whereas uh, the next bigger chunk is aluminium oxide, used, for example, as insulating material and spark plugs, uh, iron oxide, also rust, and was uh, giving the soil this brownish color in the previous picture, magnesium oxide, some of you might remember that from back in uh, the days when you still uh, went to school and we still had blackboards and chalk, not uh, whiteboards and smartboards. Calcium oxide, essential for um, steel fabrication, glass fabrication uh, and other processes, as well as uh, titanium um, dioxide used in uh, sunscreen or sunblockers, for example. So, this is what we find and it's almost all around the moon you find similar composition of material. So we were wondering, what can we do with this? Well, the European Space Agency, together with Fosters and Partners, an architecture firm, did a studies on how would such a habitat look and how can we augment it by utilizing the material we find on the moon. What you see here is an inflatable structure that would potentially be brought to the lunar surface, unfold uh, the area where the astronauts potentially would live in, and then little rovers would start scooping up some of the loose regolith, the lunar dust really, start piling it up and uh, sinter it around the lunar base. Sintering is a process where you just basically bake the dust into a brick and form an outer layer, an outer wall around the base. So this wall would then protect the astronaut in terms of radiation, in terms of uh, huge temperature differences and also potential micrometroid impacts. Good, but this was not really enough for us. We were thinking, okay, this is very rudimentary, this is very basic, so we use the material as we can find it and form it into a brick wall. So we've been doing some digging and thinking, what else can we do with this material? So first of all, we need to gather the material, yeah? collect like, um, resources or actually areas with a certain high content in silicon or titanium or whatever it is we're aiming for. And once we gather the material, we can then try to extract individual elements like silicon, for example, titanium or aluminium, to then produce more advanced things on the moon. And one of the topics I'm really interested in uh, researching is how we can build solar cells on the moon. Why we would want to do that? Well, we certainly need power for a lunar base. And, um, Bringing in like a huge amount of solar cells is quite a lot of weight. And if you remember from before, we only have six tons that we can bring. And like, uh, it doesn't seem viable that we have a lot of solar panels that we bring with us. However, if it would be possible that we manufacture solar cells on the lunar surface directly, this would be a, a huge cost and uh, weight saving. And we can use that uh, little weight that we can bring up there for some more scientific equipment, for example. This is how we envisage this, how we uh, think this could work. We have a, a rover that would take the lunar regolith as it is, melt it down into a glassy face, which provides like the back uh, plate for any electronics or device we would want to manufacture. And then in a second run, once it is cooled down, we'll have a rover starting depositing layers of uh, silicon material on the surface to form these solar panels that would then be ultimately powering up our base. So this is really the, the vision on like how such a future lunar base could be powered. Not maybe uh, during the, the first landing, uh, for sure the astronauts and um, the space agencies would provide initial uh, power to start a base, but medium term this could be the solution for a lunar base, but also future um, scientific equipment that you can bring to the uh, surface, like telescopes for example. 
Coming back to what I was saying initially, so ultimately our goal will be going to Mars. And the Moon seems to be a very good proving ground for our technology for going to the Martian surface as well. And already now people are looking at how can we um, use the material on Mars as well to do the same thing. The composition of the Martian soil, the Martian regolith, of course, is different than uh, the lunar material. However, it is similar in that sense that we can also use it to build habitation. What you see here is a project I've been working on with my colleagues from the Astronaut Center in Cologne. We called it Lava Hive, and it was investigating how we can use the Martian regolith and a novel lava casting um, process to do basically the same thing you've seen before on the moon, have an inflatable structure and cover it up with a, a lava cast um, material. One thing that is also very interesting and we're interested in uh, investigating a bit more is how we can recycle parts uh, of old spaceships. So the roof you can see on this image in the bottom right is basically the back plate from a Curiosity-type rover lander that was landing on the moon, and it's been recycled to put on top of the Martian base to, again, save some weight and uh, leave more of the equipment, uh, more of the weight for equipment that we can bring in. Because on the moon, we can just bring six tons in a single-shot mission to uh, the surface, whereas on Mars, you can imagine it being even further away, it's uh, much less. So let me conclude. For our vision of bringing humans to the Martian surface, it is essential that we really find out how we can utilize the local resources and manufacture and build devices and habitation that can augment our mission to make future space exploration a huge success. Thank you. <laughs>